Well, hello. Uh, you're looking at uh, Channel 17's uh, regular series show, Public Affairs, Public Access. Now, it was named Public Affairs, Public Access before we adopted the name Houston Media Source. And we didn't see any reason to change it because we are, after all, the access channel for the cable companies, and so public affairs, public access still worked, whether we were Houston Media Source or some other exotic name, that's the way it was. This is the first of a series of programs under the cover of public affairs, public access about the machinations of the Texas legislature. The Texas legislature is now in session. They meet for five months every two years, and there will be some discussion of that during the course of the program. We're going to touch on how bills get filed, what happens to them after they get filed, and what's going on. And I'm going to talk a lot, not on the lines that you can see projected behind me, but between the lines, what's really going on. Because we're talking about Texas politics. And I don't care whether it's Houston City Council, Texas politics are Texans who've gone to Washington. The one thing I want you to understand about this show and everything that relates to it is those people are never talking about what they are talking about. That's the first rule you need to understand. They'll be talking about a lot of stuff, but there's always a hidden agenda behind that and a bunch of other hidden agendas lined up behind that. So the bill will be captioned, a bill to eliminate boll weevil infestation in Texas cotton fields. An important bill. Because you've got to realize there's a whole lot of land out there, and a lot of it's broken up, a lot of cotton growing out there. And that affects farmers. What affects farmers? That's Texas political business. Now, hidden in that bill will be 25 things, like um, uh, outlawing... Um, a sheriff from interfering with a patent medicine being sold in Midland, Texas will be under this Cotton Bowl bill because that one's for sure going to pass. And to help me talk about that, I have gone out of my way to find a guy from Angelina County, a real bona fide Texas snuff dipping Texan, not ordinary Texan, snuff dipping Texan from Lufkin, Texas. And, uh, but he's a thinking snuff dipping Texan from Lufkin, Texas. He's reaching his pocket getting out his snuff right now. Oh, he's got in his upper pocket now. Uh, just, in uh, case just, in, just, in, just in case this happens. But Richard Nevels is with me tonight, and Richard and I are old friends. Uh, we've been down a few trails together, and we're going to uh, we're going to bring you an insight into the Texas political process as it occurs in the Texas legislature. Now, Richard, I started off saying these people meet five months every two years. You got any other suggestions? Could be better. They could meet two months every two months every five years. Work a little better. Yeah, uh, that would be a little time between elections, and they wouldn't have to steal so much money to run. And mm -hmm. and we don't pay these people very much, Richard. Uh, well, see, it's not what they make while they're there. It's if you ever looked at the retirement when they get out, they get like 165000 a year when they decide to quit stealing from the public trough. Directly. That's it. The they don't want them to go cold turkey. The salary for a Texas state House of Representative member is about six grand a year. Mm -hmm. Can't live on that. And I, what, seventy two hundred for the Senate? Yeah, well, not much more. Yeah, seven thousand, seven two hundred. Yeah, the, the, those salaries are not a living wage. Yeah, but they don't they don't count for 
the paper sacks in the cafeteria during lunch. Tell me about that. Well, go to the Texas legislature. Don't worry about what's going on on the floor. Watch what goes on in the cafeteria during lunch. There'll be these what they call, lobbyists sitting around with tables full of pa pla paper sacks. Them little paper sacks you put a beer can in. Yeah. And I promise you they ain't beer in them. Oh, they're flat. Oh, yeah. Actually, they're kind of triangle shaped. <laughs> <laughs> but actually what Richard's talking about is what I've actually seen. I, I've, I've been down there, the cafeteria one time, and sure enough, there was a lobbyist over there uh, uh, with a bunch of paper sacks, and, and every legislator that came in to get coffee or something to eat passed by his table. Yes, sir. They shook hands, and the legislator left with a little brown paper sack. Yeah, he wasn't passing out Budweiser. No. Uh, uh, but if the most honest legislators could not, on that salary, afford an apartment in Austin mm -hmm. in addition to their home. Well, they get a per diem while they get a there. per diem. But, but even that ain't enough to rent a room at the Motel 6. Yeah, right. It's, it's, it, you've got to go pretty down market in the motels. So a lot of them wind up bunking out in their offices. Mm -hmm. Well, the problem is there's no showers in there. They've got bathrooms, mm -hmm. got sinks and toilets and things, but there's no place for them to actually take a shower. So the longer they try actually, to live that way, the riper they get. Actually, they got a gym in there for them, and they got showers in the gym. Okay. So after, now, now that they started locking the doors after 10 o'clock, they can slide down there and grab a shower when nobody's looking. But have you ever noticed that it's only the new politicians that uh, are bunking in their office? They've been there for a year or two. They staying at the double tree around the corner? There's a lot of double tree residents. There's oh yeah, a whole lot of double tree residents. And then there are those that move up market from there. They have their uh, uh, there's a couple of high rises within walking distance of Capitol mm -hmm. Building and all of that. Uh, they've all got parking spaces. Uh, there's parking spaces for uh, members of the Senate and members of the House that are reasonably convenient to the floor. Mm -hmm. Now the originally we had the Capitol Building. And all of the office spaces were within that building. Mm -hmm. And whenever the Texas legislature increased from a previous lower number to the 150 members that it now has, they went in there because everybody had a high ceiling because the building was built before air conditioning. Mm -hmm. Now, with air conditioning, they lowered the ceiling <laughs> in a lot of those offices. So you have an office down here uh, or two offices down here in a suite and two offices up a narrow stairway in the suite. But then they run into handicapped accessibility problems. And so they built what they call the annex, which is an enormous complex of very nice, large, handicap accessible offices that are basically below ground level behind the Capitol building, between Capitol building and, and I guess, uh, 11th Street. Mm -hmm. And uh, those facilities are new and modern and very nice. And so And that, you forgot one thing. What's that? While the original Capitol was built by convicts, they figured out how to convert public money into private hands, and the annex was actually built by a subcontractor after he'd spent a little time in the cafeteria. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and the concrete came from Stiles mm -hmm. uh, Concrete Company in Beaumont, who was uh, not quite, but almost Speaker of the House at the time. <laughs> uh-huh. And Speakers of the House have an enormous amount of power. Uh, uh, Speaker of the Texas House, and, and, and Sam Rayburn was a Speaker of the Texas House. Uh, Jim... Jim uh, 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 Wright 
Sam Rayburn, Speaker of the United States House of Representatives mm -hmm. later, and Jim Wright, Speaker of the United, House, United States House of Representatives, they both cut their teeth down as Speaker of the House. Lieutenant Governors have a lot of power. They are virtually, Lieutenant Governor sets the agenda for the Senate. Speaker of the House has to work through committees to set the agenda but the Speaker of the House literally controls the Calendars Committee. So anything that starts somewhere else by the time it gets to the floor has got to go through the Calendars Committee. And uh, more about that, people whose name you recognize. Members of the Calendars Committee for many, many years uh, in Austin was Sylvester Turner, who's now the mayor of Houston. Deborah Danberg. De Noel Deborah was chair of the Elections Committee. I thought she was on calendars no, too. No, she did. She did a short stint on calendars, and it she, there was so much money offered, and it spooked her. Deborah never wanted to get caught with her hand in a cookie jar. Deborah she, never needed a cookie she jar. She never to get into a cookie jar because she had she she was well to do uh, from her father and her family. I mm -hmm. talked to her day before yesterday. She's in Austin. Uh, well, all upset about the election results, and then I told her about the Harris County result, and she settled down. Uh, all right. If you're elected to Texas House, and you go over there, the first person you've got to speak to is the Speaker of the House. And he's going to tell you, I don't want to hear anything from you, till you've been here two terms. If you can't get elected and get reelected, you sit over there in the corner and shut up. You're going to have to get elected and get reelected. So for the first two terms, four years that you're there, uh, you get to look at other people's bills and decide if it gets to a committee that you're in or to the floor, you can vote on it. But you don't offer up a lot of legislation. And if you break that rule, that Speaker of the House is going to punish you for that. Mm -hmm. So the Texas legislature, uh, the first four years there, your you do furniture, what you're told. your furniture. Then you'll get assigned to a committee. If you're lucky, it will be a committee of some substance. Now they have got the Texas History Committee. That is not a committee of substance. They ain't got any money. They ain't gonna be allocated any money. They think about Texas history, but they said, why are you worried about that? We've already got the San Jacinto Monument. We got the Alamo. We know where Goliad was. Uh, uh, Shut up, we don't want to hear from you. So that's a bad assignment. You're not going to get much done. However, <laughs> that's where they sent Harold Dutton mm -hmm. in his first session. And he commenced to think of so much of Texas history that nobody ever thought needed remembered <laughs> that they gave him a better committee just to get him out of that one. And that's one way you can play this game. You can play this game by saying, no, I'm not going to sit in the corner and be quiet. You can play this game by showing people that you've got intent to do something with the assignment you've got. And then you go on, ultimately, Deborah Danberg landed in the elections committee. Well, what the hell is that about? I mean, what can you do there? Well, how about changing the law so you can carry a list of candidates you're going to vote for into the ballot place. You mean that was illegal? Yeah, it was illegal until Deborah Denberg changed the law as chair of the election committee. Now, she served several years in the election committee before she was chair, but she became vice chair, and then she became chair, and when she became chair, things began to change. We have very generous early voting in Texas. Deborah Danberg wrote the legislation, got a sponsor in the Senate. Now, if you write legislation, 
you got to go through two processes. You'll see them behind me. One of them is for the House and the other is for the Senate. A bill cannot become law unless it passes both houses. So a legislator introduces a bill and it goes then from the introduction and it, according to this chart, it goes to hearing, but no, wait a minute. The legislative council gets its hand on the bill that you've introduced. And the first thing is, where are all the commas going to go? And where do you put the semicolons? Punctuation has a great deal to do with the meaning of the bill. And just because you may be a lawyer, the Deborah's a lawyer, or you may have done this or you may have done that, you might not be able to write precise legislation. So they've got a bunch of guys and gals over in the Legislative Council, and they are not lawyers, they are linguists. They figure out what you're trying to say and they make sure that you say it with correct words and pronunciation. I don't know if I would go quite that far. They try to create, rewrite the bill in such a fashion that most people can't figure out what they were trying to talk about. <laughs> Therefore, it makes it harder for people to object to the bill. Well, of course, what you say has some grain of truth. But that is especially in drafting language for referenda. When it comes to what is on the ballot, you're asked to approve this constitutional amendment or that constitution. Try to figure that stuff out from what's on the ballot. While I'm not so worried uh, if I can figure it out, I'm wondering if half the representatives on the floor can figure it out. Well, that's probably true. Well, I guess if they got a good staff, somebody will explain it to yeah, them. Yeah, they got a staff. And, 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 and as a matter of fact, far more valuable to the process than the legislators and the senators themselves are their staff. True. You've, I mean, I mean, uh, we got a state representative from Houston. Uh, I know her well, uh, uh, but she's a lawyer. But her but is saved daily in the house where she got a lot of seniority by her staff. She got the best staff in the Texas legislature. Why? Because these other people that come in and hire good and train good staffs, when they get sick of it, decide they're going to get out of there before they get caught or some other reason, and they leave the legislature, then what happens is she'll send somebody and steal her staff. And she's got so much seniority, she's got such a large staff, and her salary of her staff are higher than other people. All of that's based on how long you've been there. Your seniority increases. If you're, every session you're there, you get more money for your staff and all of that, and that becomes quite accumulated. So we've got a Houstonian that is the dean of the Texas House of Representatives, and we have a Houstonian that is the dean of the Senate, and they're sitting pretty, you know. Uh, the senator from Houston, who is the chair of the Criminal Justice, Criminal Jurisprudence Committee, uh, is uh, John Whitmire. John Whitmire has got in enough years of service that his staff in Houston is good enough to be his staff in Austin, and that rarely happens. You have a staff in Austin to do the real work, and your staff in Houston kind of feeds into the more experienced staff. And then John gets a staff member simply because he's chair of that committee. He's the only Democrat that's chair of a major committee in the Texas Senate. That's John. And he's got a nice Mercedes for being up there for so long. Oh, yeah. John, John don't drive cheap cars. Oh, no. But he still drives. <laughs> it's not a limousine. He still drives. Yeah, I've seen him some nights. Maybe that's not a good thing. Oh, yeah, I've seen him some nights when that wouldn't be a good thing, too. Uh, Sinfronia Thompson is uh, the gal with all the seniority in the house. Mm -hmm. Now, what perks do you get if you got all that seniority? You are a few steps away from the floor of the 
House where you are a senator or House of Representatives. So you go back stage behind the central chamber of the House of Representatives and there is the Speaker of the House's office and Sinfronia Thompson's office <laughs> off of the main receiving room back there. And what goes on back there is uh, amazing. You talk about the brown envelopes down in the cafeteria. That's up there is where some serious money gets changed. Oh, so you're saying they get it delivered so they don't have to walk that far? They don't have to walk down. If, if you're back there in that, that ante room, it's kind of an ante room, right? The, you got the floor of the house and there's a wall, the speaker of the house and the podium is there. Right behind that is uh, the suite of offices, which can t include the uh, Speaker of the House, whoever that is, that changes from time to time, and uh, uh, Sinfronia's office. And then uh, the back at the back of the ch House chamber are the handicap seats, because it's more convenient to get the wheelchairs in back there. <clears throat> There's a... Uh, <coughs> Four desks back there. They're a little larger than regular desks uh, and uh, uh, wheelchair jockeys. Uh, four Hispanics and one uh, f female, white female. I always thought that's where they sent people who was yeah, in was, the way. It, yeah, it was kind of kind of that idea. But it's convenient to bring a wheelchair and get in there. And uh, but you notice it doesn't get picked up by the house cameras. No, it's out of the it, it does not much. Not much. Hence, unwanted stepchildren. Uh, uh, so so, but but there's some pretty. I've seen some pretty effective legislation come out of that back quarter. Yeah, but they hide it. Yeah. Uh, and then in the house, there's a podium in front of the speakers, Jerry. Mm -hmm. And then there's a podium in the back of the room. And if you come in to introduce a bill, you're recognized by the speaker and you go to the front podium and introduce the bill. Then those debating that bill from the other side on the other podium. So if there is opposition to the bill, there's literally a polarity in the room that only gets interfered with um, uh, uh, whenever they bring in decorations like holiday or something because it covers up the anti. So some legislation gets timed to when there's decorations in the room. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it, it's really an amazing sport. I love it, you know. And uh, in front of the chamber, in the back chamber, you know, that's the ante room for the speaker mm -hmm. and Sinfronia. In the front of the chamber is the lobby. Well, guess who's in the lobby? Lobbyist. Mm -hmm. and Where do you they, think their name came from? Yeah, and and then they got Aaron boys, which are students uh, up there, kind of on fellowships. The pages. The pages. And the blue jackets. And the little blue jackets. And so a lobbyist said, "Come here, son, or come here, young lady, and give them the name of a legislature, and they go in and give the legislature." Invitation to come, they give them a business card and a name, and they go in and go to the name and give them a business card. The lobbyist wants to talk to them, and they come out and talk to them out there. And that's where a lot of real stuff happens. You've seen that? Yeah, because they go outside to discuss price and then go back in and vote. Yeah. <laughs> that kind of like catalog auction, wouldn't you say? Oh, yeah. Isn't that the way it works? So that's they, the way it works. Just selling them hogs on the foot? The only difference is in the viewing gallery, if they let the lobbyist in there, they just raise their hand with their bid. <laughs> put the far, put the one on one side, one on the other. You far it over here, you against it over here. It's like that Eddie Murphy movie I gave you. Yeah. If you far it, I got money for you from over here. If you're against it, I got money for you from and over I here. That. I enjoyed that movie. Yeah, there was a guy explaining how, how do you make money in the legislature. And it's, the bad part is, it was actually true, closer to the truth than anybody wants to realize. Yeah, uh, if you want to see some good movies about the legislative process, 
Thank you for not smoking is an excellent move. Mm -hmm. to go and to. distinguished gentleman is the other. And distinguished gentleman is the other. Go uh, Google that and uh, Netflix it and you can see it. But still, though it is corroded, mm -hmm. to the degree that it may actually be corrupt, they do stuff. And some of the stuff they do is good. And unlike uh, you've said many times, I don't really mind them making a little money on the side as long as they do what we need them to do. Who is we? <laughs> Isn't that the question? The general population. Okay. I don't mind if Billy Bob beats out Jim Bob to build, to fix this section of I-10. All I care, as long as it got fixed and we didn't overpay for it. So if you made a few bucks for on it, I'm not mad at you. Well, but just a, fix the damn road. There's an example in the interim session. Now, an interim stuff is stuff that happens between sessions of the legislature. Now, the legislature meets five months every two years. You remember that, and they only meet in odd numbered years. So 2017, they're in session. 2018, they'll be running to, for the next session. Elections are in even numbered years. Service is in odd numbered years. Between the last session, which would be 2015, and this session, they had an interim committee on sentencing reform. All right? So that meant that they had hearings all over the state. John Whitmire as chair of the Criminal Jurisprudence Committee of the Senate and his equivalent in the House and other committee members in their committees would travel to various cities and hold public hearings. You say, wow, that's pretty impressive for sentencing. You know what it was about? Marijuana. <laughs> they're never talking about what they're talking about. And if they carpooled, they really could have made some money. Yes. Because not only were they getting their per diem pay and they were getting their expense account, they were getting 57.5 cents a mile for every mile that they drove. And whether you rode with somebody else or yes. not, you got 57 cents a mile. If you took a plane, it didn't state. matter. 57 cents a mile for every mile the plane flew, plus they could expense the airplane ticket. Of course, you know that the state representative, the Democrat state representative in Austin, was just charged and indicted over that very issue. Okay, well, I'll be impressed we see a conviction. Well, we hadn't seen a conviction yet. But she That's just a negotiating tool. <laughs> She was going to vote the wrong way on something. I mean, we, we had uh, uh, Rick Perry get indicted on three things, and he just became energy sec secretary. They were just trying to get him the hell out of Texas. Was that? And he's in Washington. He took a hint and left. And if you haven't seen today's committee hearing, hunt it up. The perry Frankel exchange is one for the record books. That's worth doing. But that sort of thing happens in Texas, too. Mm -hmm. But the state representative representing uh, the most liberal and educated section of Austin was just indicted yesterday or the day before for um, padding her expense account to a felonious degree. In the first place, she was charging to travel to Austin to go to the session when she lived in Austin. And then the second place is that she owned a home in Austin and she was ch charging extra for housing when she already owned a home there. And that's, uh, that don't count. Yeah, but uh, as you have stated many times, they're never talking about what they're, they're talking, talking about. So my question would be, what does who want from her that they feel like they need this much pressure to make her go do. 
Because it's not like they're actually going to convict her of anything. Well, and, and the amazing thing is that this has also come up at a time after the state of Texas, both House and the Senate, went out of their way to virtually eliminate all ethics protection oversight. Mm-hmm. They did that after the Perry stuff. Oh, yes. They got rid of all of that that created the problem for Perry. And uh, um, because they can do that. If you write the laws, then you can write them any way you want to. And you want to write them to protect yourself, just knock your lights out. And you get a lot of agreement from other legislators to do that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Doesn't matter which side of the aisle you're on. Yeah, that's bipartisan stuff right there. Well, Richard, what do you think uh, we can do with this program to help these folks out here understand what's going on in the Texas legislature? Well, as I said earlier, they write the laws to be just as confusing as humanly possible. We're fixing to give, give folks, as, they, as you usually say, the redneck version. We're going to take what they try to complicate and put it in plain English. Well, we started off talking about the importance of agriculture as Texas law. Mm -hmm. There's an awful lot of agricultural things going on in Texas. Yeah, but that doesn't hold a candle to the law bills that have been filed. I stopped counting at 63 different bills for folks to learn how to use a gun if you're going to get a con uh, concealed weapons permit. So far, we've got 63 different versions of telling people they actually have to learn how to hit their target. Yeah. Yeah. Why? Why, why do you think that's true? La politicians who get elected feel like they need to go to Austin and do something. So they go up there and they try to do the most least offensive thing that will bother their constituents that they can possibly think of. Well, they're so all they can, well, let me write this bill that says this guy has to practice using his gun once a year in order to renew his permit. Guy goes to the gun range once a month, he's like, oh, I don't care. Yeah. If they say I got to go once a year, I go more once a month. So she didn't bother anybody. She didn't offend anybody. Nobody's watching all the other stuff behind them they're doing. And she got a few bucks and from she, the NRA. That's it. But I, I, I saw, read about the last NRA convention they had. Yep. Big sign out front. No gun. No guns allowed. <laughs> now... You're the NRA, and you don't want somebody to bring a gun with them? <laughs> you have to wonder. You have to wonder. It, 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 it's amazing. Uh, it, it may be they ain't talking about what they're talking about. But that's not my favorite bill. Okay. And this one, I'm going to have to go to Austin and see if I can't become a contractor. Okay. Maybe find me a black female put up front okay because you know te you minority, Texas minority, minority works yep and me being a white redneck don't tend to work so well I don't look good on paper okay but uh they want to monitor well, they want to check your birth certificate before you go to the bathroom and I want to be the guy that hires the person that subcontracts to all these other people to have people sitting at the door check, it check your birth certificate before you go in there. Okay, okay. Because you go ask anybody, they're like, we don't care. And if you go, well, into, no, the, wait a minute. If you if gotta, go into a women's restroom, they got stalls with doors, so how the hell they're going to know? Men like, well, don't really care. It's not like we're going there to socialize. We don't go to the bathroom in groups. Yeah. We just go in there and leave. Yeah, yeah right. So we don't really care, but if well, that, since now, it's such a big thing to the lieutenant governor, 
I'm going to help him out. Yeah, we've been talking about the Speaker of the House. Well, over on the other end of that long hall in the Cattle Building is the Senate. And who has got that kind of power is the lieutenant governor. Lieutenant governor right now is Dan Patrick, whose uh, senatorial district, surprisingly, borders Rice University and includes a lot of pretty sophisticated, intelligent, educated people, but they keep sending him to Austin to represent them. One suggestion is just if we can keep him in Austin, he's not in the neighborhood. <laughs> And as, uh, as Richard pointed out, sometimes politics just works that way. Oh, yeah. But his big thing is a bill that would say that you can only and always use the bathroom that matches the gender on your birth certificate. Well, how mechanically would you do that? Well, in the first place, everybody that wants to use the bathroom out of their own home would need to have a copy of their birth certificate. Mm -hmm. Now, if you if you have you pulled out your birth certificate, look, it's a big piece of paper. It's it's eight and a half by eleven or better, with all that lacy stuff around mm -hmm. it. You were born, celebrate, celebrate your father's name and all that. Well, to facilitate that. A service to miniaturize your birth certificate. I was leaving that to you, so that way we ain't in competition. Right, right, and 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 I think that I mean, if you go to, you know, I used to work for Southern Microfilm Corporation. I mean, those are the mm -hmm. folks that do it. Lay that sucker down, shoot it, drop it down to whatever size you wanted to. Wallet be. size. Yeah, pocket size, just about driver's license size of your birth certificate, laminate it, you got it. So if somebody says, let me see your birth certificate. There you yeah, go. well, I'm willing to survive, provide them with the people who, to who do wants that. that. And I'll take the business of making the miniature thing. That's it. And uh, uh, we will come to this television show in much nicer cars. Well, you don't get much nicer than your pickup truck, but. Well, we'll just get a bigger one. <laughs> <laughs> they make bigger. <laughs> they make a larger size. I'm, yeah. I'm surprised at that. <laughs> yeah, I have the XL. They make the double XL. Oh, the double XL, okay. Mm -hmm. Now, the the deal is, is that who benefits from this legislation? Uh, sounds good on TV. To whom? Uh, well, there are people, I'm sure some of them live in the same county I do, who stay up nights wondering about, uh, is there going to be a woman that comes into their bathroom tomorrow? Now, this well, is it, probably it, the it, same it, guy who, ain't, who hadn't left his driveway in the last 50 years, but I'm sure he's there worried about, Who's, who's going to go to the bathroom should he decide to go? All right. But what I'm more worried about, has anybody actually figured out what it's going to cost? Because, you know, they might stick to miniaturization on the taxpayer. As in, just like you pay for your driver's license, you got to pay for a miniature copy of your birth certificate. Yeah. But then who are they going to get to monitor it? We're going to have to have people who monitor it. Then we're going to have to have people in case somebody don't want to show their birth bath, their birth certificate and goes, go in there that anyway. That's a backup. That's backup. Then they're going to have to have transportation for the backup to get up to get to the uh, scene of the crime. Is that going to be a DPS or will there be create a new police agency? Well. We'll start off like we always do with subcontractors, and then Texas will decide, well, maybe we need to put them under a police agency to give them arrest power yeah, so they, if, they if, can arrest them and when they go And if they're going to they're going to need guns. Right. And then they're going to need squad cars to take them from the point of arrest down to the county jail. 
Yeah. And then we're going to need bigger county jails because we're going to have, and we got a whole new crimes and we're going to need more judges and more judges are going to need more staff and all these things because somebody had to go to the bathroom. Hey, it wasn't that long ago people used the tree around the corner from the courthouse. You can't do that in Harris County. <laughs> that's true. You get a sex offense and have to register for the rest of your life. Uh, that's true. And if you presumably if you but violate this law, ago, was... presumably if you violate this law, you may have to be a lifetime register. Then you need more people to supervise more registered people. That's it. This is a jobs program. That's what it is. Head to hell with manufacturing. We got the jobs problem solved right here. There you go. Hence, I want to be the guy that hires the people to monitor the restrooms and supplies the people. And of course, you know what it takes to get those contracts. Oh, yeah. Little I got to go bag. with a bag in the cafeteria. I know. <laughs> I've been around a while. I know where I got to go. <laughs> it's the Texas legislature. Now, here's the other thing. Remember way back here when I said between step number one and step number two, they checked the punctuation? You remember that? At the same time they sent the bill after it was punctuated and worded correctly, they sent the same bill to another division in the Legislative Council, which are a bunch of law students. Mm -hmm working on their degrees over at the University of Texas. And they went through the bills and previous legislation, why would we pass the same bill we passed two years ago or four years ago or six years ago if that one was still good? They check for that and they check for its constitutionality, but they don't change the bill to meet constitutional hoil. Why? Because the legislature reserves the right to pass legislation that is on its face unconstitutional. And the phrase they use in the committees when somebody comes in and testifies, wait a minute, what you're doing here violates this section and that section. Because I've been down there, I've testified before those committees saying, wait a minute, this violates the Eighth Amendment or the Seventh Amendment or the Sixth Amendment or the Ninth Amendment. You go in there and you put that out and they say, that's not our problem. We're going to pass this bill and let the courts sort it out. Sure, it's a job program for lawyers. And so that... The same people who were trying, were uh, the law students who were checking it now get to challenge it once they get a graduate. And that'll help them with jobs. Jobs program for lawyers. <laughs> because my favorite thing about the legislature, you know how the legislature gets a law degree if you're a legislator. Yeah, you take a shortcut. Yep. You go over here and say, I want a law degree. They say, okay, well, go sit in that room. Would you like something to drink, maybe something to eat? They, you say, sure, they'll bring you whatever to eat and to drink. Then they'll bring you this piece of paper and ask you to fill it out. You put your name and the rest of the information on it. Then you go back to eating, and then you take your nap. And by the time you get up, they got your law degree for you. <laughs> it's already printed And you done got your bar card all at the same time. All at the same time. Isn't that amazing? I'm telling you. I don't think it's quite that simple, but it comes, you get a lot of shortcuts. And if you get elected just of the peace, you don't have to be a lawyer to get elected just of the peace, but you become one soon thereafter. Mm hmm. I know, my, I've run for just the peace a couple of times. Actually, you don't have to be a lawyer to get elected to any judge position. Yeah. They got somebody there to tell you what the law is anyway. So. Sure. Well, uh, here is a little hope. I don't know how many, you know how many bills have been introduced in this session? Uh, several hundred at this no, point. No, it's several thousand actually. It's, it's 3,000 or better. Well, I haven't looked since last week. 3,000 or better. I haven't looked okay. before, since before the legislature started. Well, there's been several thousand and a lot of them are like you mentioned, like all that 
12 builds or 15 builds, all dealing with, you got to go to gun. I stopped counting at 56, 58, yeah. something yeah. like that. There's the same thing over and over again. And one of the jobs of the speaker's uh, staff and the uh, lieutenant governor's staff is to combine duplicate builds and see if we can't get the language such that they can put a bunch of builds under one cover. Uh, it just means you have more sponsors for that bill. Then you go around looking for co-sponsors of your bills. Oh, and the favorite bill we were discussing a while ago? Yeah. Had six co-sponsors so far. Six co-sponsors so far. So there are six people in the legislature who are worried about you making sure you get to the right bathroom. Worrying about you going to pee. Mm -hmm. Potty patrol. Yep. Of the thousands of bills that introduced, they will actually wind up dealing with under 200. Mm -hmm. We'll make it through all of the committee sessions and all that. Most of those will die in calendars. Most of them. So the House and the Senate will jointly vote on under 100 bills and they will pass over 50. And most of those will be vetoed by the governor. Mm -hmm. So, while you're sitting over there worrying, oh my God, they're bamboozing over there. Now, let's take a choice one. That interim sentencing committee, what to do about marijuana. They've been there before. There were interim committees between 2013 and 2015 sessions and between 2011 and 2013 sessions, dealing with the same subject, inching toward the misdemeanorization of personal use marijuana. Seeing this coming, <clears throat> the police chief in San Antonio said, we're going to get ahead of the way. I'm going to save me some money here. So about 2014, I was down on the Riverwalk in San Antonio, and this kid came by smoking a joint. Two cops stopped him, took the joint away from him, field stripped the joint, scattered the marijuana into the river, wadded up the paper and put it in his pocket in which they found another joint, which they fished out and they field stripped that, put the marijuana in the river, wadded up the paper and put it in his pocket and told him to go home. They didn't give me a ticket, they didn't just go home. Which seems to be like a sensible thing to do rather than give a teenager a criminal record. Makes sense, right? That police chief is now the police chief of Houston. And that's where we're going. And the chair of the Committee of Sentencing Reform is John Whitmire. And um, I'm not going to put John's business on the street, but it wouldn't surprise me if John had not been in the company of some green leafy stuff at some point or another. And that will be all going to legislature. So the statewide standard will probably be a citationable offense if you get caught with an ounce or more of marijuana. Now you say an ounce or more. That doesn't sound... An ounce is a lot of marijuana. It's what you call a three-finger bag. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot of marijuana. And you get caught with an ounce of marijuana and they give you a ticket, save the marijuana for evidence. So you lose your dope, you get a ticket, and you got to go to court and maybe pay a fine not to exceed $200, but it'll be more like 40 by the time you get to court. Mm -hmm. And do you have any idea what that will do to the prison population in Texas? Because that same joint in San Antonio that got field stripped in Crockett, Texas is a trip to jail mm -hmm. and a Class A misdemeanor to be tried in front of a county judge 
Your lawyer is going to cost four or five hundred dollars. Your bond is going to count some more. And then by the time you pay your fine, that 18 year old kid will have to have generated a thousand bucks just to deal with that case. Well, if you left your garage door open in Crockett, Texas, and you have some tools in there, guess where he's going to get that thousand bucks? Doesn't that make sense? It does. And well, he wasn't a bad kid. He was just a normal kid with a couple of joints. Crockett, Texas. But that, we made a lot of fun of the legislature this We'll this keep evening. on doing that. Yes, we will. But there are some very important bills that are actually in front of the legislature. Okay. We have a bill to eliminate the death penalty in the state. Yes. Harold Dutton has introduced it. Yes. In the House. It has a Senate. We have a bill that would outlaw the death penalties in the law of parties cases. Change the structure of the law? We have a bill in the legislature about removing, a, for making uh, a traffic ticket, basically any tick, ticketable offense, no longer a jailable offense. And given the people who have died over the last couple of years, behind that, that's a very important thing. That we also have another bill in the Texas legislature that says they cannot for, they cannot do a body cavity search without a judge's order first. So while we have a lot of fun with some of the bills, there are some very important issues that we will keep people updated on during this show. And there because are, those things matter as well. And there are health-related bills to be there, there are. I'm just skimming the surface. There are a great number of bills. And like you said, we'll find most of them laying by the wayside. But it's important that we keep our eyes on the bills that do matter. Okay, Richard, I've got a kind of a housekeeping question. Okay. We've launched a new project here. Yes, sir. We promised these folks that we'd be back. Yes, sir. And uh, you brought up a few topics, and those are just some of the things we're going to be talking about as these bills mature. Right now, there's not a lot going on because they haven't settled down with committee chair appointments and things, but that's going to happen pretty quickly now. And uh, sometime in February, it's going to take form. Sometime in March, it's going to get, we're talking about serious business. Right now, as What do we say call this project? Because when nobody gets involved, you get a Donald Trump. No, no. I said, what do we call this project? What do we do? We are part of public affairs, public access. But this is a little separate from what public affairs, public access does. So we, it needs a project name. What do we call it? Advanced citizenship. Advanced citizenship. Well, we'll try to have Mark make a flyer for that next time, advanced citizenship. Uh, uh, if the phones have been on, I haven't known about it. Did you put the phones on, Mark? We just didn't get any response, but you can call in the few minutes we have left if you've got any suggestions. But we're going to call this Public Affairs, Public Access Advanced Citizenship Project, and we're going to be back in February, a couple of weeks. Uh, and we're going to be uh, here twice in February, and uh, we'll see what it looks like by then. We'll see what the Texas legislature is doing in terms of advancing their schedule. We'll uh, put some look eyeballs on some specific legislation. If you have any suggestions that you want us to consider and follow, you can always email me at hillray, H-I-L-L-R-A-Y, at sbcglobal.net. Pretty standard stuff for a Houston email address. Hill Ray at 
sbcglobal.net. Send me an email with your suggestions, or if you get bored with that, you can just go to the telephone, look me up. My name is listed, Ray Hill. I live in Montrose. It's easy to find me on the telephone or on email. Give me some suggestions. I'll cut it up with Richard. But Richard's going to be commuting all the way down from Angelina County so that we can do this show and give you some diversity of opinion across Texas. I've had a good time, Richard. How about you? I have as well. So the name of the program is still Public Affairs, Public Access. The name of the project is Advanced Citizenship. Please help us make this show a better show by incorporating your suggestions and your ideas. Now just a minute to plug Houston Media Source. If you've got some really good ideas and no way to get them before the public, we got a way. Houston Media Source, we have the equipment, the studios, the training, and voila, here we are on Channel 17 in your living room. That is available for you to utilize as a citizen of Houston who wants to project your ideas, your community, your thinking, your neighborhood, whatever it is you want exposed to a larger audience, we are here to provide that service. How do you access it? You go to the web page, hmstv.org, and if you're not ready for television, but you are ready for radio, we have that too in-house. There's a studio a few paces from here. Good setup. You go on internet radio and you can go literally global anytime you want to. My name is Ray Hill. My partner in this project is Richard Nevels. Say good night, Richard. Good evening. And uh, if you don't catch us on the rerun, We'll catch you in February with two more shows. Thank you.